Good evening, and welcome to the Adrain Automobile Museum in Newport, Rhode Island. I'm Donald Osborne, and I'd like to welcome you here to our fifth in this series of virtual seminars from the Adrain, Newport, Concord, and Motor Week 2020. Uh, our first presentation in the series was a seminar called The Next Next Generation, in which we chatted with four young enthusiasts, a 17-year-old, two 13-year-olds, and a 10-year-old, who uh, assured us that the health and happiness of the collector car world is very much in good and vibrant hands. We then went to our next program, From the Racetrack to the Opera, which coincided with our exhibition here at the museum by that same name, in which we explored how manufacturers succeeded both in building racing cars and luxury and touring cars. For that program, we were joined by Anne Brockington Lee, one of the leading car collectors in the world, with an amazing collection of Ferraris and Rolls Royces, and uh, Stephen Babinski, one of the leading restorers in the world with Automotive Restorations in New Jersey, who has won many prizes at leading Concours around the world, including best in class at Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance in California, and from Milan, Italy, by Louis de Faberbeckers, the head of design for Touring Superleggera. And they talked about the characteristics that make cars memorable in these two very disparate categories. Our next program was one called Real or Fake and Does It Matter? A very controversial topic about when is it possible, when is it permissible, when is it not to build a replica of a competition car? And that program featured me having a conversation with Bill Warner, the founder of the Amelia Island Concord d'Elegance and a noted racer and race photographer, and Miles Collier, the chairman and founder of the Revs Institute in Naples, Florida, and the owner of the Collier Collection of amazing sports racing cars at that location. Our most recent program was one which is also quite interesting, where we had Jay Ward, the creative director for the Cars franchise of Disney Pixar Studios, talk about creating characters from cars. And for that program, we were joined by the real life Sally Carrera, living in the Porsche Museum in Stuttgart, Germany. All these programs can be seen on the Audrain Museum Network YouTube channel. Tonight, we take a big look at small cars. This is a part of our program, which is titled, Toy Cars Can Be Serious Business, and it's to celebrate the current exhibition here at the Audrain, Small Wonders, Mini, Micro, Pedal, and Toy Cars, which opened recently and runs through February 14th, 2021. And our introduction to the world of small vehicles happens at a very, very, very young age. We can all remember miles we spent driving our little cars on the living room rug and pedaling along the driveways of our neighborhood. And those impressions really formed a lot of who we are today. And yet it's quite interesting that today, the toy car and the pedal car have become objects of great collecting interest. And we're going to have a chat tonight with a collector, with a curator, and with an auctioneer. And we'll look at some of the reasons why we love these things so much, what they mean to us, and what they say about history and how it can be relived in a very interesting and intimate way. First, I'd like to introduce Bob Evans. Bob has been a car guy almost since birth by his own definition. His parents started giving him promo cars, these promotional cars to help promote the sales of real uh, cars for birthdays and Christmas from the age of seven and he became addicted to the collecting of them. Uh, it got to the point where his collection of these cars reached 2,500 examples. Uh, of course, he's also, as many people who collect small cars, a big car collector as well, with collections in Massachusetts and Arizona. And recently, downsizing uh, his, his homes has caused him to downsize his collection of models as well, so he's down to a mere 500. I'm not quite sure how he, he can just sort of scrape through. Good evening, Bob. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Nice to be with you. Uh, appreciate it a lot. Uh, yes, I have been a, a car guy forever. And uh, it, the, the whole toy thing, I guess, really became important to me during the winters up here in Massachusetts because I couldn't play with my big cars. And so consequently, uh, you know, they were away for the winter. And so I had to have something to keep me uh, uh, happy and contented. And so it became the collecting of, uh, of promo cars and, and all, all kinds of toys. Well, it's, it's something that is 
shared by a lot of people, and we're going to learn a little bit more about the specificity of your particular interest uh, in a moment in a place that is one of my favorite places on the planet, a place that I think that a lot of people, certainly that I know, don't know about, is the Speedway Motors Museum of American Speed in Lincoln, Nebraska. I had the great pleasure of visiting uh, the facility uh, a number of years ago uh, in my role as an appraiser, a member of the American Society of Appraisers. Uh, the automotive specialty groups gets together once a year to discuss best practices and share war stories. And we meet in various places around the country. And a few years ago, we met at the uh, Speedway Motors Museum of American Speed. And I was absolutely blown away by the collections of race cars that they have there. The Miller Room alone is something which is just makes my, my eyes uh, curl. It's, it's astonishing. But as someone who is an enthusiast and collector of toy cars, I was absolutely amazed at the amazing collection of toy, tin toy, and, and pedal cars at the museum. And we are incredibly thrilled to be joined by Tim Matthews, who is the curator of transportation, motorsports, and automobilia at the Speedway Motors Museum of American Speed. Uh, welcome, Tim. So good to be here. I'm, it's such an honor to talk to you and to have uh, our other friends with us. It's going to be a fun night. Can't wait. And uh, Tim, uh, like us all, has, has been fascinated with automotive history and vintage toys from a very young age. And um, he worked as well on the business side at Speedway Motors, on the big car side, um, until he graduated to work on the small cars. Uh, he's got a BFA in studio sculpture. And of course, we often uh, uh, refer to cars as great sculpture, kinetic sculpture. And uh, Tim, uh, like me, uh, comes from both an artistic background and the practical automotive background. And I think the combination is quite natural. Even Absolutely. Strange. <laughs> 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 and uh, has also had advanced uh, studies in advanced metal casting and kinetic sculpture in Europe and here at the University of Minnesota and the University of Nebraska. And in his spare time, I don't know how he has any, but he also builds traditionally inspired hot rods and continues to create automotive inspired art. And last but not least, we have Rory Brinkman. Rory is the founder of Brinkman Auctions, a nationally recognized leader in the sale of automobilia and petrolinia. And he's a second generation collector, started collecting at the age of 12. And I think uh, you're what, you're 25 now, uh, Rory? It's somewhere around 25. <laughs> <Somewhere around 25. laughs> Just had my birthday, so. And uh, he, he learned early as, as a well, very well-trained collector, which has served him well in his career as an auctioneer, about how to look for things, to, to develop a very discerning eye at a young age, looking for condition and rarity, the things that are still the keys to collecting. And uh, he conducted his first auction in May of 1990. And since then, he and his wife, Cindy, have conducted over 150 automobilia auctions. And he also manages the automobilia uh, auctions for Barrett Jackson. And um, it is a fascinating thing to think about how all this works together in terms of the enthusiasm, the, um, the uh, curatorial aspects, the, um, uh, the uh, what is the word I'm searching for? The connoisseurship, thank you. And also how that relates to the commercial market. And we'll also be able to take uh, questions from you, our viewers, as well, if you have any, please use the Q&A feature in your Zoom window to write your questions in, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can during the program. Um, but, so let me just start. Uh, Bob, you, you spoke about uh, how you uh, started collecting cars uh, as a way to fill your, your winter hours when you couldn't be with uh, the, the big cars, but how did that translate from your time being introduced to these cars as a young boy to having that carry through to your adult collecting? Well, I think that, that uh, you get, as a child, you get mesmerized by particular cars. And as you said, from a fashion standpoint, from a styling standpoint, and, and that's what really stays with you. And consequently, uh, that has stayed with me as to particular cars back in the 40s when I was uh, of that age, you know, all of a sudden those, those cars made real sense to me. And so when uh, toy cars became available that looked like that, obviously I wanted them. And so 
thankfully my parents started me on that uh, on that routine and so I, I had a lot of uh, of uh, these promo cars and they were interesting because they weren't just toys they weren't just something with four wheels but they were actually represented and representative of a particular car uh, dealers uh, opted to uh, to buy these in in bulk and give them off to the children of people who shopped for cars and um, now for an example, I'll just put an example up here. This is a 1948 Dodge, okay, an original toy car, but it was a 48 Dodge. That was really important. And, and the dealers loved it because they could put their name, address, and horsepower on the top of it. And, um, and they bought them and gave them to um, uh, the kids of, of um, uh, people who were buying cars. And that's one of the things that I think made kids really fascinated by the cars. And so that really started, I didn't realize it started in 1934. My collecting started in 1945 or 50. Uh, and, and so way before I had to go way back and, and, and uh, find the old ones uh, in order to have a, a complete collection of these promos. But that's what really inspired me. And um, Bob brings up a very interesting distinction, I think, um, certainly for me, uh, because when we look at toys, as we talk about here in this show in the Audrain, and the toys that are there at the uh, uh, American Museum of Speed, there's a difference between toys and models. And it was very interesting because the promo model seems to sort of straddle that sphere. It has the display aspects of a model, but yet the workability of a toy, because it's not something you assemble, you get this already ready to roll. As right. So uh, Rory, let me ask you a question about the market. Now, when people collect toys, are the people that collect models distinct from the people who collect toys? Yes, I mean, well, I mean, every collector goes at it for a, a di different reason. Some people are trying to, you know, capture moments from their past, from their childhood. Um, they might be collecting distinct cars that are part of their actual car collection. We have a lot of collectors who are buying pieces because they want a toy car or do a promotional that mimics their full-size cars that are in their collections. There's also, but there's a fine line between, at Barrett Jackson, we have a lot of car collectors who also collect automobilia, but then there's also a distinct between the actual car collection, I'm sorry, between the, the toy collectors who are, you know, very, trying to fill out their collections with pieces throughout the, um, I apologize. There's, I'm, <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, there's uh, a real distinct difference in, in why people collect. So at Barrett Jackson, we have a lot of car collectors who are collecting automobilia. They might be trying to mimic some of the cars that are in their collection. Also, there are, are distinct toy collectors who are looking for pieces by those great manufacturers like Steelcraft and, and another brands. So, and it's uh, something which uh, uh, Tim comes to the the history of these and the fact that certain toys are by their very nature very fragile, the way they they were constructed. And um, what do you see when you try to in the assembly? First of all, in the assemblage of the collection. Uh, if you tell us a little bit about how the collection at the uh, Museum of American Speed came about, because the founder of the museum, the founder of the Speedway uh, company, was an extraordinary fellow with a great eye. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful story, you know, of, of somebody, uh, uh, kind of the American dream, right? Bill Smith uh, started out life right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, he and his wife really started collecting uh, at an early age, right about the same time uh, the business started in 1952. So if you can imagine uh, someone that kind of built uh, a collection of, of automotive toys, of pedal cars, of racing cars and engines, anything that he was fascinated with over the years as his business grew, so did his collecting. And uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, the gravitational pull of something from outer space, right? Uh, the more the stuff kind of uh, congeals, uh, the more other people want to get involved. And it's just been this wonderful uh, scenario where, you know, Bill's passion really fueled uh, the launch of the museum and the launch of the collection. But in the time uh, since then, all the way back to 1952, 
there have been all these amazing people that also want to help the museum and have their precious items kind of come to the collection where they can be enjoyed by more than just themselves, which I think is really amazing. And where did the collection start? Was it with the pedal cars or was it with the, uh, the, the toy cars, the tin cars? You know, that's a really great question. And, and uh, you know, Bill really started collecting things uh, as, as a young fellow. He was enamored with the Model T Ford, and that's kind of where it all started. And he uh, helped uh, haul scrap metal uh, for a man here in Lincoln. And as he did that, you know, he was able to, to work off a Model T. So uh, in exchange for his help, he was able to get this Model T. And of course, if you know anything about Model Ts, they're always breaking down and leaking. And, you know, so he became very uh, mechanically astute, you know, keeping this thing going. But what he was, he was also finding is as he was uh, working on his Model T and hauling stuff is he'd find all these early speed parts, you know, and uh, he became enamored with people that really wanted to make the Model T a better product, you know, to make it go faster, make it more reliable. So he started collecting that stuff first. And that's really where the collection began. Uh, but Bill never had a pedal car, you know, then it was one of those great stories It's something you didn't have as a kid later in life, when you have the ability, uh, you, you go into it big time. And that's exactly what happened to Bill. He didn't have a pedal car as a kid. So, uh, you know, as he started seeing them out in the world, uh, he'd start buying them. And one of the wonderful things about Bill Bill's collecting is he was very uh, uh, he was very careful in how he spent his money. So he wasn't spending big money on this stuff. You know, he was buying it before a lot of people really cared about it, which is pretty neat. And which is uh, another interesting uh, question for you, Rory. Um, as we've seen the collector car market um, grow exponentially, as more people have sort of been exposed to collector cars and want to live with collector cars, and uh, certainly again. Um, dealing with uh, automobilia, again, something which is designed for temporary use, uh, you know, for very commercial use. Uh, have you, what kind of growth have you seen in the toy collecting market in the last, let's say, five or 10 years? Um, I'd say that there's different aspects of automobilia that's seen a lot of growth. Unfortunately, I'd say with the toy market, uh, at least with, let's say, pedal cars at Barrett Jackson, um, they kind of hit their hard point probably in 2015. Mm -hmm. We sold the Ron Pratt collection. We sold 66 pedal cars for an average of right around $17,000. Uh, we had some reach up to twenty-seven and thirty thousand uh, dollars Overall, the entire auction brought about a million dollars just for the pedal cars. His overall collection brought over four million of, for the automobilia aspect of that. Uh, but on the toy side, I think right now is a great time to get into buy. Uh, most collecting is cyclical, and at least from what I can see with pedal cars, uh, they are a little depressed right now, so it's a great opportunity to take advantage of that. Uh, I, I think they actually were at their high point in the 90s and early 2000s. And um, the collectors who are buying them now, are they looking solely at, or are you mostly selling restored cars? Because I know that one of the great challenges is the fact that there are some modern pedal cars that have been made. And so for people that don't really know what they're looking at, it can be very difficult because you can buy a brand new car and think that you're buying a restored old car. Reproductions, just like all facets of collecting, are a real issue when it comes to toys and with pedal cars. Uh, at Barrett Jackson, we try to um, scrutinize everything, make sure that everything is properly represented. We specialize in only selling old and original pieces. Um, right now, with what, what we really sell, and that's with your earlier question about the toy collector and other collectors, uh, it, to me it seems like the toy collector is more of a purist. They mm -hmm. would really want old and original, not restored, whereas a lot of pieces we saw at Barrett-Jackson are more for our car collectors, and they want the cars to be as pristine as the, you know, full-size cars that are in their collection. So we sell a lot of, I mean, pretty much all the pedal cars we sell are restored or highly restored. Uh, when it comes to promotional items or promotional models, like Bob collects, uh, we try to mainly sell what's called new old stock, which are original pieces still in the original box. Um, we like everything to be mint or near mint to mint condition because uh, uh, condition and rarity is what we really strive for, so. Yeah, I'm going to get back to you on that as well. Uh, I just made a little note to myself. Bob, um, since you, as I said, you collected these from the time that you were a boy and you continue your collection, build your collection as an adult. 
Now, do you still have some of those uh, promos that you received as a boy in your collection? I do still have uh, some of those. The ones that I didn't really like, I didn't uh, paint them or do anything else. The ones I really used and, and uh, went in the sandbox with and so forth, I repainted because I wanted them in another color. And, uh, you know, you end up uh, with these things that aren't worth that much because they've been well used. But I have several that I didn't like back in that era that have never been touched and still sit in my collection, never been touched. And so well, I like them better now, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> and, and as a collector, and this is probably one of the most difficult uh, decisions for collectors to make who are deaccessioning, um, how did you make, how did certain items make the cut and others not for you to keep? You mean when I started to downsize or, or um, yes. actually I downsized in segments because the promotional cars really started in, in a slush cash mold made by a Chicago company in 1934. Well, finally they, were, they, they weren't as authentic as the, when the promos turned to plastic. And so in the 50s they went to plastic and they're still with plastic and so forth. But I, what I did is take that segment of plastic promos when I had to downsize, got rid of all of them. So I really didn't have virtually any at all of those and concentrated on the metal ones, which, which were the original promos. And uh, right now, I've, uh, they also made promos in trucks. Right now I'm in the process of getting rid of my truck collection because that doesn't mean much, as much to me as the, as the cars do. Bob, I have a question for you on promos. Uh, is there a holy grail for promotional uh, cars, that one that you searched for for a long time? Yeah, there is one that I have, a 1934 Ford. Uh, we think that the company went to Ford and tried to tell Henry that this would be a great way for his dealers to advertise his cars, and I think they were thrown out. And so we think that uh, that, that they that there weren't many uh, right now we can only count two in the world and they now um the, the last one that that went on the market went on for ten thousand dollars for a little for a little car like this so consequently the, that is the holy grail i guess i have one of those i have the other one the one that didn't can, get sold can so i forth. send you our address when this is all <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great a 34 ford and a rare promotional i love it all right that's all right. <laughs> now, one of the things that, um, uh, uh, Tim, when people come in to, uh, to visit the museum, what do they, are they, are they just, as I was, simply overwhelmed by everything and just want to take time to look at everything? Or do people sort of gravitate towards certain areas of interest, the pedal cars, the unrestored pedal cars, the non-car form pedal cars, which are also fascinating. You've got spectacular boats and airplanes and all those sure. things as well. Um, or the tin toys. I mean, frankly, I did not have enough time there to spend as much time as I needed to just with the tin toy cases because I could have spent four days just on those. Sure. And, you know, as you can tell from the view behind me, you know, this is one room and the collection's so dense and there's so much to see. I, I you know, you're an art person. It's kind of like going to the Louvre in Paris. You know, you, you can't possibly cover all the ground, right? And, and maybe you're just there to see the Leonardo da Vinci paintings. And, and that's really how it works here. Uh, people will come and they'll say, gosh, I heard about your lunch boxes. And, and that will be their takeaway, right? They'll leave and they'll say, wow, those lunch boxes were great. And I said, well, you just walked past a Tucker, you know, and, and didn't <laughs> you notice that, uh, but uh, you know, but it's interesting in that you have to have all these sub collections uh, because no matter who comes through the door, you want to be able to give them an experience. So when they go home, they remember uh, their time here. Uh, but you're right. I, I think people do uh, kind of come for a, for for what they might expect to see, and then they'll always find something unexpected as well. And and hopefully it's that unexpected thing that hooks them to come back again. Yeah, as I said, I have to come back. And for me, of course, I was there for a meeting and to look at cars. And I was completely blown away by the lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got on my phone to this day, still show people all these pictures of the lunchbox. It was absolutely astonishing. And that was definitely like, uh, like me and, and Mr. Smith. I never had a lunchbox as a kid. So I only ever carried lunch in a bag. So I always wanted to be one of those kids with a lunchbox. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> lunchbox. Um, but the, um, 
we have we have a question which was an interesting one um and this i guess comes to the idea of what the role of a model car is and that'll get me also to this uh case behind me which has some tin toys in it and and i'll ask this question uh of you as well person that wants to know if we if he was to make or she was to make a car for the road to make a scale model first that gets into another category of cars which i also love which are styling models yes and those are fascinating i i happen to be lucky enough to have him in in my collection a plaster styling model it's a um, it's about um, i don't know three inches thick and it's just the side view of a uh concept Plymouth sedan from 1953, which I actually bought at Ferret Jackson. Um, and um, it's a fascinating thing to me because I've always loved these styling models. They're very difficult to find. Are there any styling models in the collection in, uh, in Lincoln? Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. We, we just installed an automotive art gallery, and as part of that art gallery, we thought it'd be very important to get out some of our styling models, so we have quite a few. We also have some models that were done by young men as part of the Fisher Body uh, Modeling Guild, which are also very fascinating. It's interesting to think about what young men in the 50s thought cars should look like, you know, and, and I thought all the cars in the 50s were beautiful, but obviously they weren't good enough for those young men. Uh, and there's some pretty wacky looking ones back in our art gallery, but they're fascinating. Yes, they are fabulous. I also have a 1949 Fisher Body Guild uh, car as well. Um, Bob, did you ever have any of the styling models as well? I had a few um, and have sold those off through the years, but, uh, but they are fascinating. I find that the that to to keep them up, you know, they you really have to look at at. Uh, I mean, they crack and they lose their paint and so forth. So you really have to make sure that they're they're protected from the sun and all of those sorts of things. Uh, you don't have to be as careful with that with the promos, but um, but certainly uh, you do with that. And so that was one of the reasons that caused me to say, you know, I can't take care of them well enough. So consequently, maybe they'll end up with Tim. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's why they've all been showing up yeah <laughs> that's right i'm going to say now i realize that that um we managed to put together a fairly dangerous combination here because i got here on my windows tim up top like the angel on one shoulder and rory like the angel on, i say angel i didn't say devil on the other, <laughs> thank shoulder, you, thank you. The other shoulder saying well you know bob perhaps you might consider giving me a call <laughs> yeah you might have some grandkids you need to send to college and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually sold a, a styling model, which ended up being like that. Uh, we had a family who consigned to us the 1956 Pontiac Club de Mer uh, styling uh, model. But it was a full size. It was about 40 inches long. And it was uh, actually showed at all the Motoramas alongside the big one. And the engineer who designed it got it back after the Motorama, brought it home, put a little like, electronic engine in it and uh, had, as a kind of a pedal car, electronic pedal car for his children. And um, afterwards, it went into storage, and the family consigned, they had it restored, they consigned it to Barrett Jackson. This was like 2012, 2013. And uh, I, I believe they were hoping for about 15000 It brought $100,000. Wow. wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah. oh. so, wow. And, and that's a happy ending, by the way. So that's, sure. uh, yeah, I, I'd that's say. That's super. Um, and again, you know, one of the things that, uh, and I know that you'll appreciate this, uh, Rory, as well, um, as an appraiser, um, obviously I am asked often for the value of cars. And here in the museum, people often come in and say, wow, this is amazing. What's the most valuable car in the room? And, and the answer that we like to give is, what's the car that makes you smile the broadest? You know, that's the most valuable car in the room. And um, as a consequence, however, these objects, these toys, these pedal cars, um, we talked about condition, we talked about the fact that they do require upkeep. And that's something which a lot of people don't think about even with large cars. You know, what are the, the, the collecting uh, criteria uh, for maintaining a car like this? Tim, I mean, I'm sure that with the collection of the size of your museums, uh, conservation has got to be high on your agenda. It's huge. And, you know, it, I get a call often when somebody wants to donate a car. And, of course, your knee-jerk reaction is always, absolutely, you know, it, it'd be great to have one of those. You know, but then 
you, know, you have to sit and think about, okay, uh, how much does it cost a museum to store it? Uh, how much does it cost to make sure that it's lubricated and things aren't going to rust and that, you know, people are careful around it? And yeah, so those are all considerations that, that we're thinking about all the time at the museum. And, and it, it is a big task. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's one worth tackling for certain vehicles, but you're right, it, it's uh, something to consider for sure. And Bob, you know, obviously as somebody who collects full-size cars and uh, models, um, you mentioned about the, um, the construction techniques of the early promos versus the plastic and some of the needs that the plastics have in terms of preservation. Uh, people don't really think about the fact that you can't put them in front of a, a window that has sun, uh, the, the amount of light that comes on them, things like that. So. What are some of the challenges that, that you've seen uh, in the years uh, maintaining your collection? Well, these early metal promos, uh, they chip and scrape and uh, you, you can't drop them, that's for sure, because they, 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 you could have a real tragedy on your hands. So uh, consequently, you have to make sure that they are also sort of out of the sun or they will fade or their tires will crack and so forth. So there is a little bit, uh, there is a little bit to that, there's no question. Uh, I'm just thrilled when I see collections like uh, like uh, Tim's and and of course I'm uh, because I'm into the uh, the big cars as well. You got to have a garage that's filled with automobilia, and so consequently, you know, I'm always on the run to to find that for my garages and so forth. Um, and and that's a, and that's a thing by itself that's great fun. It's, I mean, this this is a fun hobby. It's a thing that keeps me that keeps me going. I think. Bob, you know, you, we were talking a little bit about uh, some of the promos through the 50s. And, you know, I, I've always loved 57 Chevys, but I don't think I've ever seen a 57 Chevy promotional that wasn't warped like a potato chip. And so it didn't even really look like itself anymore. Uh, ha, did some work worse than others or, you know, in, in terms of conservation? Uh, are, is that part of collecting, looking for one that has less warpage than others? No question. And part of the warpage could have come in manufacture because of the type of plastic. But the other side of it is that if you leave them in the sun or whatever, that really does a number on them. So, and there are collectors out there that know enough about how to cure that by virtue of heating up the plastic and so on. I've always been scared to death to do that for fear I'd end up with a bunch of plastic in my hands and that was it. Uh, and, and they're able to straighten them out. And so they look, they look decent. So you do find that there's some great, huge collections of plastic promos that, that are just fantastic. And uh, Rory, for someone who has always had a casual and passing interest in uh, models and toys. Um, what kind of homework would you suggest that they do? And, and you know, how open are you to, to hearing from people who are interested in collecting to, to know sort of what the trends are, what people are looking for, what might be available out there? I probably hear from people daily, actually. There's a lot of people that just contact me with, can you tell me, can you tell me about this piece that I found that was my grandfather's who just passed away? to um, we're looking at downsizing our collection. Can we get some sort of value with it? Um, I think that there's lots of great books out there. What's nice about the internet, there's a lot of information available on the internet now that didn't exist 20 years ago when you were collecting. I mean, I'm at shows and I'll see other collectors and dealers even bringing up information on their phone, uh, which again, 20 years ago, it was, you know, what you had, uh, what, all of the knowledge you, you'd learned and carried was your advantage. Nowadays, the advantage the internet really kind of is the equalizer for everybody when it comes to information. And I mean, there's YouTube videos, um, you can look at past auction results. Most of the other auction companies, including Barrett Jackson, our full catalogs are available online now with all the history. So you can go look at Barrett Jackson's, you know, 20, 30 years worth of car and automobile history with descriptions and all the, the, the knowledge. So uh, using a simple web browser, you can Google, uh, you know, uh, 1920s tin press litho toy, and it'll show you all the manufacturers, give you sales history, everything, so. Um, let me ask you another question about the market itself. Um, obviously the collector car market is very much an international one. Do you find in your sales that the toy market uh, is also as international or is it much more 
um, Americans looking for American cars or American manufacturers and Europeans looking for European cars and European manufacturers. What, what do you see in that? In your That's what I, I, I really come across is um, the European market, the people who collect European want European pieces and same with the American market. Uh, we are picking up more international buyers, uh, a lot from Australia actually right now. Uh, there's a lot of Australians who are interested, and th they're going after American pieces. Um, but it is kind of continental when it comes to collecting. And you sell equally um, uh, continental models versus American models, or do you mostly sell American? We, we, we mostly sell um, American models. So, mm -hmm. be it pedal cars, promotionals, or uh, tin toys. Uh, we, we, we do sell more uh, European other forms of automobiles, such as signage mm -hmm. and, and, and advertising pieces. But when it comes to the toys and pedal cars, it's pretty much mainly all American. And uh, Tim, in the collection in Lincoln, I know that you've got um, cars from all over the world, especially in the, uh, the tin car categories. Um, is there, um, when you, your visitors come in, do they seem to be interested in all the cars and, and or just certain types of cars or categories of cars? You know, more recently, one of the collections that we've been growing here at the museum is the uh, Spin Dizzy or Gas Powered Tether Car Collection. And we've had some great donations, one from a, a nice uh, fellow named Eric Zausner that uh, almost doubled our collection. And, and uh, so recently, we've been putting a lot of energy into that uh, collection. I brought a couple examples in behind me that, you know, that are pretty spectacular. And I think uh, once you hook a viewer, you know, once you get somebody in the museum, I think we've all had that experience where we'll go to uh, a car museum and you know, you'll have a bunch of Duesenbergs or Delahays lined up and they're all gorgeous, but there's no real human story behind them or you don't know the history. So here at the museum, we really try to tell the history behind the cars. And a, a lot of times with these spin dizzies, uh, they have such great history. You know, the people that built them and raced them, you know, during the war years, uh, you know, when there were fuel rations, you know, so there's, you know, that hooks viewers immediately. So I, I see them getting excited about those. Obviously, pedal cars are, are a great draw because people can remember, you know, if they didn't have one as a kid, you know, they could imagine what it would have been like. And, and uh, you know, it's funny, you know, as we as we're young, all we want to do is be older. And then when we get older, all we want to do is become <laughs> young again, right? And so I see that all the time at the museum. Not here at all. Um, this is a question that um, you may be able to answer, Bob, uh, with your uh, knowledge of these things. Because it's a question, actually, uh, it's a terrific one that just came in that I wonder about. Because when I was a kid, I uh, built a lot of models, um, uh, the model kits, the ones that AMT and, 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 and Johan made. And the question is whether you know if the molds still exist for the promos that AMT and Johan made. I think they do. Uh, the interesting thing is that a lot of uh, collectors now have been <clears throat> making out of the promos the particular model that they wanted. Well, the, you know, a, a particular car might not have come as a convertible. Well, let's use a kit and make that convertible so that consequently we have, we have uh, something that represents that model. And the interesting thing to me has always been in kits that the ones that have the value is the unbuilt ones. <laughs> and if you if you built them and so forth and had they have little value you know um and so uh i have a uh a, a lotus model that was professionally built as a kit i mean i don't know where the kit came from uh and it's magnificent very delicate and so forth but i can't find anybody who's you know who wants to give 25 bucks for it you know so so consequently, you, you, just, you just don't know about the kits. There are collectors that only do that though. You know, the whole, only are involved in kits. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share a very short, sad story. Uh, a number of years ago, I thought, you know, I haven't built a model kit since I was a, a kid. I'd really love to do that again. And I was shopping someplace, at an antique shop somewhere. I came upon a bunch of uh, French Heller uh, kits of, uh, of these bizarre European cars that I like, you know, Volkswagen K70 and, and the Citroen GS, all this stuff. And I bought like six or seven of these things and just put them away saying, I'll build them when I have time. Of course, I never had time. And now, of course, I am once again in the place where these kits only have value because I have not opened them. It's right. <laughs> open the kits, it'll be completely worthless. 
Yep. It's, 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 it's absolutely astonishing. Um, another question uh, for you, Rory, on the same um, theme of what we were talking about before, about the uh, internationality of collecting. Um, Diecast model collecting, um, because certainly the big brands, Matchbox, uh, Hot Wheels, uh, these are certainly internationally um, uh, recognized and, and marketed. Uh, and even I, I'm seeing a great, um, it's not diecast, but I'm seeing also a great uh, re-entry of uh, the Shuko, both vintage and the new Shuko models uh, here. Uh, have you seen that also in, in the, uh, the collectibles market? People looking after the, uh, the, the vintage Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars? Uh, very much so. Um, lots of growth and a lot of international growth. And a lot of interest actually coming from Japan for uh, really good quality vintage hot wheels. Again, it all comes down to condition. Uh, people usually want it still in, 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 in the original packaging, untouched. Uh, dealer displays are like the holy grail uh, of, of die cast collectibles like that. Um, with the shoe codes, still stronger European demand on the collector side than on the American side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what so, I see, everyone's market's different. Everybody has different clients. So the um, well, it would be interesting because I would think that the um, certainly the big move to online selling would have really sort of opened up a lot of the great stuff that that you sell through Barrett Jackson to a much wider international audience. I mean, are um, you actually marketing to to the international audience or? not more than you had? No, uh, we, we, we definitely have a lot more exposure. We're uh, having a lot more completed sales. Uh, also, that's true on the car side. I believe that our previous Scottsdale auction had 17 different uh, countries that had successful buyers. So, um, I mean, collecting with the internet has really become an international event. Yeah, uh, it, uh, it, it is. <laughs> Undoubtedly, I mean, I've been buying a lot of art from Italy, but that's another story. Um, Tim, the, um, what do you think is the future? One of the, one of the questions that um, comes up when we put together exhibitions here at the museum uh, that are more or less um, encyclopedic or surveys, um, for instance, um, our next exhibition here after this one is a two-wheeled exhibition and it's, um, sort of the world on two wheels, 1893 to 1993. And uh, for our Concorde d'Elegance that we put on in the fall, our cutoff for the Concorde is 1973. And we have other displays where we can show newer cars. For the cars in the collection, in the gallery, what would be the cutoff point for you in terms of a, a, an object of interest? You know, that's a really good question because, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. We were working in one of our storage buildings and we had to push some cars that just aren't out on the dance floor right now. So we pushed them out as we were cleaning and reorganizing some things. And it was funny because what was out on the grass was kind of the smattering of different kinds of cars, right? It was, there were some open wheel dirt cars. There was an Indy car. There was a crazy 60s uh, uh, show rod that, that was just a wacky looking thing. But there was also a DeLorean of all things. And more people stopped to look at that darn DeLorean than to any of the <laughs> other cars. And, uh, you know, when I tell people that they're, they're really shocked, but being a child of the eighties that I am, you know, of course, uh, there, there's a lot of pop culture wrapped up in a car like that. And, you know, you know that it didn't go as fast as it did in the movie, but, uh, you know, you want to sit in it so you can feel like Michael J. Fox, right? So, uh, your question is, is, uh, really timely because we're having those discussions, uh, constantly, you know, what is the cutoff? How new is too new? Uh, and like you say, the most valuable car in the room is the one that brings a smile to somebody's face. And, and you know, for that reason, a DeLorean probably has, has a space on the floor at some point, you know. So I don't think you can uh, exclude any year, really. If, if there's a good human story behind it, I think if it has a good pop culture connection, uh, if it has a ra some racing history, then I think you, I think you can show it. Yeah, and that's uh, <clears throat> another interesting thing. This is a question that has just come in from one of our uh, viewers, uh, which is, I can't say it's directly aimed at you, Rory, but I will aim it at you. <laughs> You're lucky man. Um, this is the kind of question which, which is difficult to answer, so I'll just preface it by that. And the question is, will the newer Hot Wheels cars 
be worth anything. Now, of course, as an appraiser, everything has a value. So there's nothing that is worth nothing. But I think they're talking about, will they have collectible interest? I think that unfortunately it'll be nominal because of so many people that are putting them away. The reason why so many, so much of what we collect has value is because people weren't keeping it as a future collectible. It was discarded. It was made to be used. Um, you know, ju jukeboxes when they were worn out were thrown out. Uh, it, it's just, and so because of that, no one went and, you know, if that was the case, people would have bought, you know, 20 tuckers and put them away. No one ever did that. There, there's a reason why. So um, I, I think that a lot of the contemporary pieces, unfortunately, will only have very nominal value going forward because they're mass produced and there, there are too many people who are keeping them as future collectibles. And so um, sometimes when I've, I've had some more contemporary uh, collections come up and we've sold some pieces out of them and the items sell for, you know, 15, 20 cents on the actual dollar for what the people paid for. And that's the problem with, you know, modern day current collectibles. Yeah, it comes back to what we were all talking about at the very beginning of this uh, program. The fact that the toys that we are uh, praising today and, and honoring and, 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 and uh, celebrating are being celebrated because they were made to be disposable and most of them were indeed disposed. So therefore the, the survivors are, are to be highly prized. Um, and I've got another question here. With, the other, the other side of that, uh, if I could just cut in for a minute, Donald, is, uh, is the fact that uh, when you collect promos like I do and you go back to 1934, the number of people that are interested in those promos uh, are diminishing as they die off. Okay, the kids today want the new stuff, okay, or the stuff that, you know, when they were kids uh, in the 50s or in the 60s or whatever, that's what they want to collect not the old stuff in many instances, less collectors today than there was 10 years ago. Well, that's an interesting point you bring up, Bob, because it's the <clears throat> thing that's always traditionally held in the collector car field, the, the standard bell curve, that the cars that are popular, the cars that people lusted after when they were a teenager, and when they get to be in their 40s and 50s, you can afford to buy them, you buy them for out of nostalgia and for that connection, that emotional connection. And then there's sort of a second curve that comes up. And that's, for instance, with brass era cars. Obviously, there's no one around that knew brass era cars when they were new. Sure. And yet, there are still people who are passionately devoted to them. And that's because of the specific objects that they are. And I think that's, I think that's what we see as well here in the toy and, uh, and, uh, and uh, automobilia field. Um, the, fact that some, the fact that something has survived and speaks so much of its time makes it interesting to collectors and therefore I think drives interest and value. Would you agree, Roy? Very much. And I mean, it's, it's what people are passionate about. I mean, this is their hot, I mean, even during the, you know, economic downturns, uh, our automobile auctions were extremely strong and car collecting uh, with at Barrett Jackson, our, our, our car sales were very strong because unfortunately that's your hobby and your hobby is your passion. So, and that's really why you should be collecting. You should be collecting because of future appreciation. I'm gonna buy all these hot wheels because maybe someday they're gonna be worth a lot. You know, you should be buying what you wanna collect. Exactly. And uh, this is a joint question for, um, actually for all three of you. Um, it's a terrific question. We've touched on it a bit. And the question is when were the first car models made or mass marketing, which of course are two different questions. I mean, we certainly know that they made car models from the time they started making cars. So what are the oldest that uh, any of you have come across? Tim? Boy, you know, I'm, I'm in a room here with a, with a lot of pedal cars and it's interesting to research the history of pedal cars because they really start the same time, you know, the early Benz uh, showed up on the scene. I mean, almost instantaneously, young people wanted to emulate their parents. And a lot of these cars, like the one over my shoulder here, uh, 1924 Alamite Page, and that's 
not the oldest car in the room. One, right next to it, uh, we have one from 1904 uh, that uh, is an American Rolling Peanut, which is the oldest car in our collection. Uh, and you, it looks like if you breathe on it, it'll fall apart, you know. And uh, But yet here it is, it survived. You know, Bill Smith had an interesting sense of humor. And he'd say, you know, that poor kid died on Christmas, you know, because uh, it, it's, it's so well preserved. Uh, but... You know, so it goes, I think it goes almost back to the very beginning. And, and you know, some of the model cars that we have, some of the tin and uh, cast iron toys, especially, uh, that you know, go right back to the, to the turn of the century, which is pretty interesting. And Bob, what is the oldest one that you've had in your collections? I would say that probably these 30s uh, promo cars, are the, the 1934 was where they started. I have everything that was uh, one of most everything that was started at that point in time. Um, I haven't seen anything before that, even though toys, not promos, existed before that. Certainly in the in the um, um, the, the cast iron uh, facsimiles and so forth, uh, they existed before the promos, obviously. And uh, Rory, what's the earliest that you've handled that you recall? Um, We've had a lot of 1920s American National Pedal cars. Um, I believe we had a 1912. Uh, it was probably the earliest. Uh, lots from the 1920s. That was kind of the, the, the golden era for pedal cars, actually, with uh, American National being kind of the car of, for children of the wealthy. And uh, we've kind of specialized in selling a lot of those. You know, you touch on something interesting, Rory. You know, you think about uh, in 1924, an American National Page Roadster like the one over my shoulder was $200. And you could have bought a Model T for that same amount of money, which is, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, we, have a, we have a car in the gallery here in this show, um, which was made in Buffalo, New York. I just forgot the name of the manufacturer, of course, just escaped my head. Um, and it is approximately 1920. Um, it is built as well as a full-size car with, with full uh, stiffening ribs in the, in the uh, fenders, uh, fully framed uh, opening doors, uh, leather upholstery inside. It's electrically powered. It's an astonishing thing. And you know that it cost a vast amount of money when it was new in 1920. That's for sure. And, and, and we've actually sold a lot of those. And what's amazing is uh, a lot of the collectors like them overly restored. So we've sold some of those 1920 American Nationals with like calf skin leather seats and ostrich skin <laughs> leather seats. And, you know, chrome plating's not good enough. Let's do silver plating or let's even do maybe 14 karat gold and just I mean, over the top. But that kind of was what the Roaring Twenties was about. It was about being ostentatious. I mean, people, it was a really, you know, good time in, in America. And uh, because of that, the, the full size cars represented that as, as well as, as the pedal cars and uh, American National. I mean, there were some beautiful cars I mean, American National back then actually did a Cadillac and a Packard and uh, a, a Stutz. And I mean, all these marquee names were actually done in, in miniature pedal cars, you know, representing the, the larger version. So the level of detail is extraordinary. The, the oil cans and the spotlights and, and everything that, uh, that dad's car had, you know. Gear shifts, oh, yeah. horns, all of that. Yes, sir. Absolutely astonishing. Well, I want to thank all three of you for joining us this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I know that our viewers have enjoyed this and the viewers, uh, when this is posted on our YouTube channel, will also have the, the opportunity to enjoy this as well. And I could speak with all of you for another four hours and uh, believe me, I will follow this up uh, with lots of questions uh, for, for all of you uh, related personally to my collection so I can learn from the three of you. Um, so I want to uh, thank you, Rory and Bob and Tim, for joining us tonight here at the Adrian Museum. And um, also, I'd like to invite you and our audience to join us on January 7th for our next pro program. It's going to be a unique look into the work of one of the greatest artists that you'll ever meet, David Schnorr, who's a fellow who's designed and wrapped more dramatic racing Porsches than practically anyone else. We'll see the, his entire process from concept to execution as he addresses the Audrain's Collection's 2019 
Porsche GT2 RS Club Sport for the track. It's going to be a fascinating uh, program, and I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you all for joining us tonight, and have a great holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.